It is a great pleasure to have a conversation today with esteemed and celebrated cantor and distinguished baritone Robert Abelson. He is cantor emeritus of Temple Israel here in New York City and serves on the faculty of Hebrew Union College's Debbie Friedman School of Sacred Music. He has performed over 40 leading roles in the opera and has performed with renowned orchestras, including the Philadelphia Orchestra and mostly Mozart. Robert Abelson has starred in Broadway's On Second Avenue, and those were the days. He has recorded on several labels, including Noxos, and has appeared in film and on television. And he is one of the great interpreters of Yiddish song, both art and popular songs. So it's wonderful to be here, and I thought to start our conversation, let's go to Brooklyn. Yes. <laughs> so would you like to talk a little bit about your childhood in terms of where music in Yiddish was in your life during those years? Because it was very strange, you know, I didn't, I remember my sister taking piano lessons. My father didn't think I should take piano lessons, <laughs> you know. Anyway, and my father was incidentally did not go to shul. He was against organized religion. A, but yet, when I was bar mitzvah, somehow I felt I remember being a kid so attracted to the synagogue. I even went by myself because my father wouldn't go with me. And I even befriended an old man there. I remember him, and it was Mr. Schecht was his name, and. Uh, and then, of course, in the later teen years, you know, teen years ago, you leave it away, and uh, I was not singing. And then I, at all, I, I did not sing from elementary school where there was a kind of little show I did in the sixth grade, you know. Until, until I, then when I got into high school, I went to Boys High in Brooklyn. And Boys High had a, a, a group called the Melody Men. They were professionals. Mm -hmm. They were terrific. And we had a regular chorus. And I auditioned for the regular chorus, and I failed. I didn't make it. <laughs> Which is a big joke, and it sounds great on my uh, um, on the story of my life. So I actually didn't sing, and all of a sudden I began to sing with my friends in the neighborhood. I began to sing. I would sing carols with them, you know, because in those days, even Jewish kids learned carols. We were very careful not to mention, you know, God forbid, you know, other religious things. And uh, then when I got to, uh, I got to, uh, in my college, I, w I graduated uh, uh, from City College, and there I majored in, in accounting and business. I graduated in 1950, mm -hmm. and I was not singing at all, except when I was 18 in college, my sister, kind of, my younger sister, my voice began to develop somehow. And I, listening to recordings, I began to kind of enjoy singing a little bit, but I never thought I was good enough or anything. My sister kind of prodded me to study because with a, a voice teacher in Brooklyn who was my sister's friend's teacher. And I began studying voice. And my world was opened up into beautiful vocal music. I mean, I remember doing the duet from Traviata. It was magic to me. But I was in college, and I was started at 18. I knew nothing about music. Do, re, mi, fa, so, I knew nothing. <laughs> and I, then I got a job, believe it or not, when I began to study, I, I got a job. With, I met a, a friend of mine whose cousin was ma ma newly married to a rabbi, and they were looking for somebody in a quartet. And I joined that quartet, not uh, knowing music. I was even fired after a year. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I also began singing in another group by a, of behind cantors, a kind of quartets for the holidays, and that was my. Uh, kind of newly, new attachment to the synagogue. And I was fascinated by cantorial music. I never dreamt I would be able to sing that kind of exotic stuff because at that time 
when I began studying voice, my teacher kind of pushed me into singing in a Gilbert and Sullivan group. And I joined the Gilbert and Sullivan group and I did a couple of roles. Remember, did the captain pinafore. So that was my experience. And I joined an opera workshop and I began to sing opera. And I met my first and late wife who was in the, who was singing opera. And, uh, and we, we sang, I remember. And then I was out of that w workshop. It was the Greenwich House Music School. There was a workshop there. And the, the director, a new young director, left, the, uh, left that group and he was given money from some woman and he had a, a new company called, it was Opera 55, Opera 56, whatever. And he took me along as a band. And there I sang roles. I sang leading roles. I mean, it was piano and some orchestra. And uh, I mean, I, I did roles. I didn't even know how hard they were, but they were, I guess I got on, on stage, I sang Rigoletto. I even sang Macbeth, Verdi's Macbeth, at, in my 20s. And I didn't think it was hard. You know? <laughs> I did Cosi, I did Marriage of, I did uh, Magic Flute, I did Cosi Fantute. It, these were all, a lot, a lot of them, the Cosi and the Mozart music was in English. And, uh, and then, uh, there was, then I was in touch with other groups from some of the Viennese coaches who were around at that time. There was another group run by a Fred Popper, and he did Mozart beautifully, I must say musically, and I kind of fell in love. I always felt that if I, that I should thank God when I could sing Mozart. I still feel when I was in a Mozart ensemble, I, it, it was Rabbani Shalotam who, who put me there, honestly. So, and out of that, and then I began, what happened? is that we went to Boston with a quartet beneath a canter. This is a funny story if you want to hear. Anyway, what happened, the canter was kind of obnoxious. <laughs> so the quartet was objecting to this guy because it was about 105 degrees in the synagogue there. He insisted that the window not be open, you know. For <laughs> anyway, a Yes. And so I read, one of the fellows said, you know there's a cantorial school. And uh, why don't we all go become, and I was kind of quiet about it, never dreamt, you know. He said, you know what, we'll all buy, I just didn't have night courses, which they didn't, incidentally. And why I remember working as a, in my office as an accountant, I happened to have a solo with me because I was trying for a, a church job, <laughs> which I didn't get. But I get this call, say, you're coming? I said, for what? For the audition for the school. I said, for the school? I, yeah, I said, well, I have the salt. We said, well, come on down. I left my office, took the audition, and the cantor there said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm an accountant. He says, accountant? You'll make money as a cantor. <laughs> so of the four guys, of course, I was the only one. I stayed, I left the county, and I joined the school, and uh, that's how I became a cantor. Do you remember your feelings about entering the school when you formally went in to be trained? Yeah, I had heard something about the school and I, was, I expected, I, you know, here I was an opera singer, I heard they say, oh, there's not, I got to the school and at that time there were a lot of veterans who, who came out of, you know, who had been singing in Europe sometimes and they were older men, they wanted to perfect the, the school was there to really raised the standard of cantorial music and to reach into the classics of 19th century, which I didn't know at that time. So the, when the quality of the singers that were in the school kind of shocked me. And they were very high and, uh, you know, and I, and I didn't know music at that time. So whatever I learned, there was Dr. Fried, Israel Fried, had a class in music, and from him I learned harmony, I learned, you know, in a class. I learned harmony, I learned my sight reading got a little better, you know, and uh, it was just another world. And also the world of Chazanut. I began studying, the, one of the great teachers was Ganshoff. He was on the faculty. And somehow I did something for him 
which impressed them because no, no one prepared that day, I remember. And I came with a prepared recitative. And Gantzow was very, because I began to treat cantorian music as I would opera. I began to look into the meaning, into the dramatic possibility, because I was always interested in text and poetry. And it kind of, and actually at that time I, could, I was not really into singing songs. But on that faculty was Lazar Varner. And he remember him getting up and he was speaking about Yiddish. Nobody was interested in Yiddish at that time. Not in that school. Not in the and he kind of introduced me and everyone to Yiddish art song. And after I and I still was not into it until after I graduated, when someone we had a, a cantor Boris Grisdorf who was singing with Lazar. And then he got sick, and Lazar asked me to sing, and that's how I met him in about, about 1960. And he taught me to sing songs, and, and what happened is that when I was a child in, in Brooklyn, and we didn't have religious men, what I did was, my, I, I, I sang, in, our family was a singing family because of my mother. My mother had a wonderful voice, which I never realized until after I was studying voice, how easy it was for a go up to IF. But she was uneducated, she was from Europe with a beautiful voice. Everyone wanted her to sing. We used to go to the Boys Belt, we got d discounts because she could sing this stuff from the Yiddish Theater. And I was raised singing stuff from the Yiddish Theater. And the first song I ever learned was the Dishwasher. And you don't know, the Dishwasher by Yabakov, one of the corny songs, which later I went and recorded with the Milgram Foundation in Vienna, and I recorded that in Vienna. That's the awesome. Dishwasher, if you listen to the YouTube, you'll hear me sing the Dishwasher about an old, old man who becomes a dishwasher and his children reject him. You know, anyway. <laughs> Are there any other... Um Teachers that had a profound influence on you when you my were voice studying? teacher, my voice teacher, introduced me to the magic of of vocal music and, and classical music, and she was a wonderful singer. Her name was Edna Beatrice Bloom, not a Jewish name. She was a very strong Catholic woman, and, but she was. Um, it's um, Bloom was like a you know sounds like a Jewish name, but she was not. And she was a wonderful singer. And she basically, I studied with her. She taught me how to sing. She knew how to sing. And I, I worked with maybe two other women. One was um, Marie Louise Wagner, who taught me something about her experience with in Germany, you know. And, uh, and an Italian baritone taught me something. Well, anyway, there's, there are people that I really have great influence. I was lucky. I met people who were capable. Of, of the th teachers that I worked with, the three of them, they were all better than myself as singers. They could outsing me. And I mean, I'm sure of that, you know. And it's something, you know. And, uh, and I worked with, um, with Thomas Martin and Ruth and Thomas Martin, who were famous for their ring. I worked with Tommy Martin. And uh, and then I got I, I the things I treasure the things that I would call successful was I, I sang with the Lake George Opera and I sang you know wonderful roles it was a wonderful company it still is I think and I sang the reintroduction of the Pulitzer Prize Opera The Crucible and the play we all know, The Crucible Opera is wonderful. Even Miller approved of it when it was first written. And uh, I, suddenly there was a revision of it and I got with the original wife, who was Frances Barber. I sang with her at Lake George and I had a big success. And uh, I sang that around the country. I sang at Seattle Opera. And uh, it was, it's, very, it's an acting role, you know. It's it, acting well with very tough sing, one of the great baritone parts. And it was, I mean, people wouldn't know, unless they know that opera. So I sang, I, I sang 
and I was known for acting. I went went out on tour. Even as a cantor, I was lucky to be in a. What happened is I left my first. Con I had a congregation after I graduated in Flushing, student congregation for fifteen years. Which synagogue? Temple, Temple Beth Shalom. On 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 the Northern, Northern Boulevard. Boulevard. Yeah. I was there fifteen years, and with kids that are all you know, there's how many of them were bar mitzvah? They were grandparents now. I went to Washington Heights, in that synagogue with wonderful people, and there I, for the first time I had a professional choir, and a great organist, and I did some of the old classics there, like Lewandowski, yeah, you know, wonderful. all the beautiful classical stuff. And I did some of my, fulfilled some of my dreams and uh, in that synagogue. And also I was free in that synagogue. The pay was paltry. I wasn't broke when I was there, but I was allowed to go. That's when I went to the Dallas Symphony to sing. I sang in Spoleto at the historic synagogue, which I'm somehow related to. And there's an old story. Uh, I have a cousin who genealogist and found out that my family from Bialystok is um, had left and went there in 1840s somehow. Wow. I'm also re my grandfather my grandfather in Europe who died in the Holocaust was first cousin to Lit Maxim Litvinov, the Boston ambassador in the United States there. Anyway, that's my background. So after you were in Washington Heights, how did you come what to New York? Is that, uh, in Washington Heights there was it was a synagogue matter of fact Senator Javits had been bar mitzvah they were they used to show up. The synagogue began was very old, the people were very old, and there was a lot of vandalism, no and then the synagogue closed down. And the 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 week they closed the year they were gonna close, there was a job at my synagogue and and, and I, the cousin of the rabbi called me I matter of fact I applied to the ACC and they recommend, I called the rabbi and said, oh, we'll call you for an audition. Well, and then meanwhile, his cousin calls me say, Bob, there's a wonderful job right for you. It turns out it was her cousin. So she calls the rabbi and he calls me up for an audition. I get the job. He never called me. I'm under my official call, so, which is very funny and he didn't even realize it. That was Rabbi Zion who just passed away recently, and uh, that's I ended up in nineteen. It was in nineteen eighty, so I was I've been here. It's in this synagogue for over thirty something. Figure it out, Fantastic. you know. And I'm now retired a few years, you know. So, but I was here a long time, and a lot of kids, a lot, a lot of teaching, and a lot of. And we had in the old days, it was much more. It was much more classical. We had a quartet, and we had an organ, and we had an organist, and uh, it's become, it's different now, the world is, the synagogue world is different. But somehow, because I graduated at Hebrew Union College in 1957, I was not called to the faculty until after Lazar Weiner passed away. When he got sick, I took over his class, and when he passed, mm -hmm. I stayed at the college. That's how I entered, because he died in 1980, and I, I think it was 1980 or 81. I'm here, mm -hmm. and yeah, that's how I ended up. And for, for, for Lazar, was such an important. He was like a father to me, because I introduced some of his. The last few so the last maybe twenty something songs that he wrote, I don't know more maybe. And so he taught me how to sing. I remember doing the Heschel songs. We went he was commissioned to do Heschel. We went out to he to the God was the Cleveland or something. Went and we performed the first songs of Heschel. You and I did uh, some and of them. We did those yes, some, right, we did some yes. right at the beginning. Yeah. And I remember his son Yehud, he said, of course, the special songs are complicated, particularly the last few. And Yehudi said, I wish my dad had, had showed me those songs, I would have simplified them. I don't think Lazar wanted simple. I think he, you know, he wasn't looking he for He was simple. amazing. He was, 
<laughs> what it what he needed to say, that was yeah, what he was on the He could have made paper. money, you know, he could have made money in the Yiddish theater, but he didn't want to do that. He was a snob in many ways. I mean, you would find them at all the Weyburn concerts and, you know, all the contemporary music, and that's what he was interested in. Well, his art songs are really oh, art yeah. songs. They're, They're in really, Yiddish, but they are art songs. If You want to know something? If they were in German or in English, they would be much famous. Somehow, there's a kind of, I don't know what it is, there's a kind of, in the Jewish, in the Jewish community, they, they, they don't realize the, the, the height of art that was, came out of Yiddish, including poetry. I mean, the poetry and music was just great stuff was written, came out of, the, out of that culture, which it was destroyed by, you know, I have to say. I mean, Lazar was, uh, first of all, he was obsessed with the Holocaust, you know, some of his settings were, of his Scottish and his anima, which I premiered. Oh, you premiered it. Uh, you know that um, the famous Ari Mom yes. of his, I did the first performance of that. Yeah. I did the first performance of Yido Mit and Fino, which I thought was, oh, Yido Mit and Fino is going to be a nice, simple song. <laughs> no, it was nothing is simple. It's a fabulous song. Fabulous song. Fabulous. I did the first performance of that. Yeah. So. You inherited his mantle, and then you did teaching. Well, I, you know, I, I, I mean, coached him. Yeah, I yeah, know so, what he wanted. So, as a teacher and a mentor, uh, what do you strive to impart to students or professionals who reach out to you for coaching or in, insight wanted. into this repertoire? Yeah, he introduced me the respect outside of myself. It, it's really, I mean, it's, it sounds like I'm being humble. I don't mean that. I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's, it's a privilege to do a song and to do the song with respect to the poetry. He, he loved Yiddish poetry. And the, those were, that's what inspired those songs. I mean, his, his love for the poetry, and you must never lose that, you know, you must... You, it, it's so easy, and in my coaching, is he, there's a tendency, particularly students at a student level, people who sing later, the same thing. They just sing the song as if it's, they see it as music, like a violinist. It's a little beyond the, the vocals, the vocal art is beyond the violin, beyond the piano. There's something in the language. And then you can't lose the phrase, the musical phrase has to be there. But the language is the, you know. And the language shapes the. It, and you have to be in, you have to be into the song. Those words have to come out of you as if you thought of them, even though they were composed. That's the art. That's art. Do you encourage them to read the poetry away from the music to really learn the text? Well, that would be yeah. You encourage them, but they don't always obey you. <laughs> That's true. Yes, I encourage them to know. It's knowing the meaning of the word, but how do you in, how do you employ it so that it becomes a mode of your own expression? I mean, you can know the meaning of the word. You know, it becomes automatic. It becomes academic, but it's more. You have to make it as if you're speaking a language, a phrase, from your heart. So that, and you know, and people know that. They feel that. That's why people can go to the opera and listen to Italian opera and not know the words, but yet somehow they move, they don't know what. <laughs> it used to be. Now they have words like at the Met, you know. Super titles. And yeah, but I think sometimes it's, you know, particularly comedy, I don't think it works so well. But it's interesting when you consider, when you think about what your plan was in terms of becoming an accountant, that the two anchors in your life, in your young years, the music and the Yiddish from your home, ended up being the pillars of your work. I don't know how I got here. Now. I really don't know how I got here. <laughs> it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. I'm very, I'm very grateful for it. Yeah, I am. So, um, many may not know 
but I do, that you are also a poet. Yeah, well, and I, I think that's an poet. extension of your love of words, of, of text, and, and how you connect it to your music. And um, I've had the privilege of hearing you recite some of your poems right here during rehearsals, and I wanted to know if you would like to recite one. I'll, do, I'll read you a... <laughs> because there's a... You know, I wrote a whole... I wrote... Uh, let's say I wrote a, a poem for every Torah portion. Every Torah... Beginning of every Torah portion through the year. So, but I'm not going to read it. I wrote one here. You may be in, you may be interested in, in. I wrote one called Olam Haba, the world to come. And it says, they will not care or contemplate travelers to the world to come, or fret about minuscules like having been brilliant, average, or dumb. Or perhaps in unbridled state they'll dance among the stars, unconcerned with kin or loves or unavoidable peace and wars. Perhaps the poetic paradise will not be a paradise, will not be an Edenic state, but an eternal, unsettling surprise. That's a poem of mine. Oh, I'll, I'll read you. I'll read you about color notes. Okay. All right. Okay. Color notes. Rising from the formal shade of black, I see a blue sky, the color of fading gloom. But on vestments here, an unwelcome wall, I see crimson in blood and in blooms that may disguise distracting insensitivity. There is the purple that is on the cloth of kings, ill-fitting for ambitious commoners. I see the calming gray that lets me be until it shines silver into a smile, and yellow, the stain of gold, the light from the sun of changing spectrum. But all are only the parts of white, the embrace of birth to the shroud of death, the healing hue of truth and love. Beautiful. You like it? Yes. Well, that's nice. I wrote a poem about you. I live on the 12th Street University. So they cut all the... They, there was a garage and a restaurant famous, and they've all taken them down and building a, a high-rise. So I wrote University Place. I don't know if you know these, but, but the Cedar Tavern was famous for writers. They used to drink there, the famous writers. The Cedar Tavern fueling tastes and talk, Bradley's vibrating with brilliant riffs. They fade, but not from my memory. The sounds reverberate in song with strong plantings of fingers measured down, down for improvised shining chords of jazz silenced in an arena of shiny nail salon. The garage neighbor to a house of sculptured sushi and pizza, roasting ready for serpent snacks, mantras undisturbed by rolling bowling balls above with pins and jittery scorekeepers. But now the ground is cleaned and rectangular, naked and waiting for hard-hatted dreams, ant-like swarming to build a colony up, up into a different canvas shutting off the smile of the sun, shading and stepping into a march of change. Great. Well, those are some of my books. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. That's wonderful. Thank you for listening. Yeah, of course. So we didn't talk about Broadway. Um, your experience is on Broadway. experience. Yeah, I mean, it was... Uh, what they called me, you know, because they had done the show, Those Were the Days, and they started on the coast, and it was Norman, uh, uh, my friend Norman, I was on my name, was a baritone, and he got sick. So there was a spot for for him to sing some Jewish, you know. So they came to me, and I remember they said, well, I have to, I have to sing some aria. 
So I, I decided to translate two Italian arias that I know into Yiddish. So I took the Barbara Seville aria, the Figaro aria, and from the Italian I translated into Yiddish. And I also took the Pagliacci aria, Ridi Pagliacci, and I translated that into Yiddish. So deciding which one, the, I, then I figured, and I realized that the, the people who understand Yiddish, they're going to cry with that. Uh, they'll know what I'm saying in Yiddish. And it sounds, you know, you know, uh, you know, it's a but you know what I mean? They're going to, they're going to cry. So the other one is a little more funny, and it, the, we kept that one. That's what I did. And I joined the company, learned it, and when they opened in New York, I, then I was with the show, and then we went on tour. So do you have any thoughts about what you would like to see take place right now going forward? For the Yiddish for myself song or for, the, for the Yiddish song repertoire? I I would hope that the singers that we send out not be afraid to sing those Yiddish art songs and not and not worry about whether somebody thinks oh well who understands Yiddish or something. To ignore that, as they would ignore German leader or Italian arias. To go out and to, to let people hear this great art and not let it die. And that, that would be, you know, and not let, not let Lazard's work be in vain. Not only Lazard, but the, the other composers or the poets, let the work be heard, you know. You know, it bec it, you know this, there's something about great art and I'm sure it's even in the rock and roll, whatever it is, and in, the, in whatever they're doing, even in rap and in hip hop, and uh, there's great art, and and usually it comes to the surface and less. And I hope that this will not be forgotten. You know, we do our part. You do your part. You know, beautifully. Well, so do you. Thank you. <laughs> really. Do you, thank you. Do you have any projects coming up right now? Concerts, projects? Uh, doing that, no. The only project I have is I have a student and a, who's getting a job in New Jersey. She wants me to install her. Yeah, my present wife is a co was a co retour somehow, bit, and she had a terrific career. She was a med audition winner and stuff like that. But now we're not young, right? But what we do is that we specialize singing songs of the songbook. So we did a recording a couple of years back, and we did a program which we did at the, at the um, one of the rooms, and we did a program on, Lauren, on Rogers and Hart, a Thai program. Now we're studying, we're doing a program. We didn't record that, we recorded the other one. And we, we're doing a program now, just we're staying alive, doing a program on, on Irving Berlin and Cole Porter who wrote lyrics, and and they're amazing. I mean, the, we did a program here, and we, so Caroline, my wife is Carol, we did, we did a program of, we sang Cheek to Cheek. Now, Cheek to Cheek was written by Irving Berlin, the same guy who wrote, you know, oh, you know, I'll be loving you, you know, the same guy who wrote, and we did a song from Annie Get Your Gun. I mean, the, the, the genius of this guy. He wrote it for Fred Astaire in 1935 so he could sing it to Ginger Rogers and dance. That's the kind of, and, we, and there were songs that, and Cole Porter to me is like, Cole Porter is, is Dave Bussy. That's the talent. You know, it, it, it'll be a couple of years later. Now, kids don't even, they don't even know. They never heard of Irving Berlin. So anyway, that's what we're working on now. Aren't we? We just we'll do it sometime, but and here we sang cheek to cheek, <laughs> and we sang we sang you know uh, that song from Manny Get Your Gun, you know uh, what is it? I can't, oh, I can't remember. Anything that. you can do, I and, can do better. No, oh. the one you know. Uh, 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 Rumors fly, ta da dee da 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 dee da 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 da. You'll find that falling in love is wonderful. It's wonderful. And the guy says, 
so he says it when she he sings it she says so you say now he, you know he's trying to con her it's wonderful stuff from the from that that songbook and Tony Martin you know I'm Tony Bennett he does all that stuff now which he did he sings to die you know my opinion he's a singer who sings the words with jazz see right. with the words mm -hmm. Bis noch Münche bei dem Schall des Hudes pflegt sich der Tag des Starvertrachten. In Schules gewählt und Kuh und dort in der Winkel Hot sit there, hot mako. What is full given? Mid the hickus and psiska. Dinesha me a seira. What is right in for him? Right? I came in too early. Oh. Then a shovel is sail, I can't wait for it. The Malaha Shores, I'm getting